dear all, dear all, dear all, well, welcome, welcome, welcome that you are all here. As you know, my name is Evelyn Lindner and I'm the founding president of the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Network. Fellowship, community, movement or family, we have many names. First, I would like to thank Linda, our director and the entire Digni organizing team for making this wonderful, wonderful workshop possible. And the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution at Teachers College of Columbia University in New York City for hosting this workshop. Imagine so lovingly since 2003, every December, every year. So this is number 17 now. As you all know, our work is a labor of love. We work with a budget that is close to zero. Everyone gives according to their ability, whatever they can, their time, their energy, their creativity, all as a gift of love. I have no words to express my gratitude to all who make not just this workshop possible, but our entire global dignity since almost 20 years. This is the blue marble that we have. And this is what we do with it. We squeeze our planet to the last drop. We commit ecocide, the killing of our ecosphere, our e ecological world, of which we are only a small part, despite our belief to be its masters. The suffix side means killing. Words such as genocide, suicide, or pesticide all end on side, stemming from Latin sida, the verb caedo, caedus, caedera. We poison our planet, we drown it, and we burn it. Considering that our planet is our commons as humanity, we are caught in a global commons dilemma. Ecology just Garrett James Harden, he explained the tragedy of the commons as follows. An unmanaged commons in a world of limited material wealth and unlimited desires inevitably ends in ruin. Indeed, ruin is now global after humanity's campaign of depleting our planet's resources with ever increasing destructive efficiency. Sociocide is the killing of our sociosphere, of the cohesion in our human communities, local and global. We live in a world now where hateful polarization poisons our relationships. We have a pandemic of disconnection and loneliness, particularly in the Western world, that will outlast the coronavirus pandemic. Britain had to appoint a special minister for loneliness in 2018. Not enough, the world is also armed to its teeth. Citizens against citizens, nations against nations. So not only are we in the grip of a global commons dilemma, we are also in the grip of what political scientists call security dilemma. Since the Neolithic Revolution, the past 12 millennia or so, which is the past 3% of modern human history, the history of Homo sapiens, most of humanity lived with a lingering sense of fear as a background constant. It was the fear of attack from enemies from outside, and this could happen any time during the past millennia. The security dilemma can be summed up with the motto of Roman thinker Vigetius, if you want peace, prepare for war. Recently, we as humanity have compounded the security dilemma with a growth dilemma that says, if you want prosperity, invest in exploitation. Both dilemmas are tragic. War preparation produces war more than peace and exploitation produces ruin more than prosperity. As long as we, as humanity, do not find a way out of these tragic dilemmas, sociocide and ecocide will continue as structural violence, as systemic humiliation, humiliation congealed into systems, 
just like South Africa had apartheid as humiliation congealed into a system. Just like now, military, corporate, political systems drive global races for arms and resources. Ecocide and sociocide have the same underlying catalyst, the very weapon of mass destruction that systems of humiliation use, namely cogitocide. This term was coined by the <clears throat> former head of the Club of Rome, Prince El Hassan bin Talal in 2020. And we heard his message to the world that he made for us yesterday. And we will hear it again today at the end of our workshop. Cogito comes from cogitare in Latin, to think. And cogitocide is the killing of our cogitosphere, the killing of the realm of thinking and reflection. It is the drowning of humanity in a sightless infosphere. I therefore fear that artificial intelligence may be a misnomer. In many cases, it may rather be artificial sightlessness. It may simply be the digitalization of a kind of sightlessness that in former times was called fog of war, simply taking on a new shape and reaching new levels now. Big data, instead of becoming big success, may turn into big disaster. All those sides, all those killings amplify each other. As a result, we risk omnicide, the killing of everything, the annihilation of all life on Earth. We live in times of systemic decline, where the old order is disintegrating as environmental and political disruptions augment each other. We are at the end of a lavish party of exploitation for which our children, if they survive, will have to pay. Natural historian Sir David Attenborough said this in 2018. Right now, we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years. <coughs> Cultural historian Thomas Berry is right. We cannot, have <coughs> we cannot have healthy people on a sick planet. I call it systemic madness waiting to, to be transformed into systemic sanity. This is where we stand as humanity. In this situation, can we imagine a world without borders and without military forces, only with the rule of law institutions that keep individual dominators from undermining the global commons? Can we imagine, <clears throat> of, imagine a world of shared global commons, a, of global unity in diversity, collectively protected and replenished? Can we imagine a dignity economy? Can we imagine globally inclusive cooperation instead of cooperation only sought for the sake of ever more effective domination over enemies? Can we turn systemic madness into systemic sanity? Can we turn sociocide and socio-ecocide into what I call sociosanity and ecosanity? Socio salvation and eco salvation. <clears throat> Can we make such a world work? The answer is a resounding yes. Very few people take it in, and this I notice all around the world that our species, Homo sapiens, lives in a historical moment that is unparalleled, not just in terms of crises, also in terms of opportunity. History is not a predetermined process with humans as helpless victims, particularly not now. For the first time in our history, we, humankind, are in a position to succeed in bringing about the adaptations that are long overdue, basically since millennia. Adaptations that our forebears could not bring about because they did not yet have the tools we have. Our ancestors could not see the pictures of our blue marble from the perspective of an astronaut. For the first time in our history, we as humankind can fully appreciate our place in the universe. Unlike our forebears, we have the privilege of experiencing the overview effect with respect to our planet. We can see it from outside, an effect that helps us understand that we humans are one species living on one tiny planet. Furthermore, we know that human nature is neither good nor evil, but social. And this means that human action depends on the ways constitutive rules frame relational contexts. In other words, cooperation and solidarity in the world 
can be nurtured systemically through building appropriate societal frames in our global village. As we have made our income and our GDP dependent on the destruction of our planet and ourselves, a strategy that ultimately destroys the very foundation of our income and GDP, we need new societal frames. Only when a given system has small problems is it enough to ask small questions from within the system. When a system has big problems, it is time to ask big questions from outside of the system. So I therefore suggest we sit together as humankind, all of us, and many people do that already, and find out which of the existing regulatory rules that we have can be sufficiently tweaked and if not, let us create new constitutive rules of engagement for our modern world system. In this situation, at the moment, we fail. And this is an overview. I will jump over, uh, over wake up calls uh, that fail to wake up, us up sufficiently and uh, the opportunities that if we use them, we use them too timidly. Due to time constraints, I jump over it and I ask you to think of Titanic. We as humankind can no longer think of ourselves as sailing on a luxury cruise ship. What we thought of a, as a cruise ship is a Titanic on its way to the iceberg. People of the so-called global north and the so-called developed countries are the ones who live on the luxury first floor of the cruise ship. They rip out planks from the hull of the ship, there where the poor people live, to enjoy fireworks on the first floor. When they see cracks in their luxury cabins, they repair them with the best intentions, while overlooking the huge holes they create further down in the ship. Offering charity to the poor does not achieve what is needed in this situation, namely the change of the design of the ship and the change of its course. Even the world's best intended philanthropy, if combined with might is right competition, cannot define the design of our global strategies. Slowly, we realize that we are on a lifeboat, not a cruise ship. In a lifeboat, all hands are needed on deck. Everybody has to contribute with, with what they can. Nobody can buy themselves out of this joint effort. Whoever tries to gain short-term personal advantages by exploiting others or ecological resources contributes to the faster sinking of the lifeboat. Infighting will make it capsize and nobody will survive. This is the iceberg. Yes, and now I would like to tell you a little bit about me. This is uh, the rural context in which I grew up. This is the place where my parents were displaced to after World War II, and this was when our planet was still blue and green, imagine. Coming from a deeply traumatized family, traumatized by war and displacement, I see it as my responsibility, my duty, to use the privileges I have been offered in life, together with the technological opportunities of our times, to try to understand our world so I can suggest viable paths into the future. This is my life mission since childhood. By now, I look back on 45 years of being at home on all continents except Antarctica. Since 45 years now, I live globally and locally at the same time, deeply rooted in many local places, binding them together with love and tenderness into lived cosmopolitanism. Through living in the global village, I'm neither a Western or, nor non-Western person. I'm simply a global citizen in practice, not just in theory. I am a patriot of Earthland, including all its living beings. To realize this global dignity mission, I had to adapt my practical life far beyond what most people would consider possible. It has proven necessary that I live with as few possessions and little money as possible, because otherwise my privileges would undermine my mission. If I were employed at a national university, for instance, or were to receive major funding from one particular source, my dignity mission would be suspected of being informed by national or corporate interests. 
money also easily erects social psychological barriers. It tends to turn I thou relationships in, into I it relationships to use the coinage of philosopher Martin Buber. Loving care is at the core of my dignity work. And this means furthermore, living one integral life rather than many separate lives. It means, for instance, intentionally minimizing the separation of professional and private life. Just now, I'm talking to you from the living room of my father, who is 94. It is part of my dignity mission to keep him flourishing also in the times of a corona pandemic. Uh, Danielle had her son with her, um, Veronica, and uh, so I, I love it when, when our, our members of our workshops and our, our um, community include their children, grandchildren, and uh, all generations. I'm the co-founder of a new educational effort that we launched in 2011 named World Dignity University Initiative. And we wish to invite all learners and educators for whom dignity is central to contribute. In my work, I use the ideal type approach of sociologist Max Weber, which allows for analysis and action to proceed at different levels of, of abstraction while acknowledging also the gray areas in between. Traffic can illustrate that. Each society has to decide on whether to go for left hand or right hand driving. Diversity can only reign for the vehicles and driving styles that people might want to use. When these different levels of abstraction and action are confounded, accidents are the result. These are my books. And if you write to me, I send review copies to you as PDF files. I see humiliation as an interpersonal act, an emotional state, and a social mechanism. And therefore, it needs approaches that are trans, multi, and cross-disciplinary, as it is relevant for a wide range of academic fields of inquiry, among them history, social philosophy, political science, sociology, global studies, anthropology, neuroscience, and not least, psychology. Humiliation is relevant for all life-centered psychologies, clinical, health, developmental, cultural, community, social, political psychology. In my writing, I attempt to bridge academia's siloization by striving to understand the core messages of various fields of academic inquiry, and then I bring them together on different levels of abstraction using precisely the ideal type approach. And finally, I attempt to reconstruct them from the perspective of dignity and humiliation. So far, I have done with war, genocide and terrorism, international conflict, gender and security and economics. Some of my writing is also in other languages, among them Norwegian, French and, and German. Here comes a very important caveat, and Linda pointed at it already. While I am the founding president of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies and Linda, our director, we are also researchers on our own account. This is a very important point because when I speak about my work now, this does not mean that my views should define any official position of our community. On the contrary, I wish to inspire all of you to forge your own pathways to exploring dignity and humiliation. The maxim of our overall dignity work is unity in diversity. And in our role as conveners, Linda and I attempt to nurture unity by holding diversity, the diversity of our network members' views, of which Linda and I, in our role as researchers, are only one part. Now comes my view. Why do we fail? Why do we fail still today? Even though we have so many opportunities. Starting about 60,000 years ago, many of the world's largest animals, also called megafauna, began to disappear. First in Sahul, the supercontinent formed by Australia and New Guinea during the periods of low sea levels. Recently, just very recently, scientists found evidence that early human predation contributed to that megafauna extinction. Throughout the past millennia, and this is a, an image from a museum in Stavanger in Norway, throughout the past millennia, particularly since the Neolithic Revolution, we, the species Homo sapiens, have increasingly become proud of our ability to be in control, to dominate, to win victories. Pride in human exceptionality and superiority became definitorial. 
throughout the past centuries, particularly the past decades, we have driven competition for domination and control over people and planet to hitherto unseen extremes, nations against nations, citizens against citizens, and all against nature. At the same time, we regard dialogue, mutuality, and nurturing as secondary. I was trained in medicine and psychology, and therefore I like to use the image of the human body to illustrate my point. Since the Neolithic Revolution, the so-called dominator model of society became prevalent all over the globe, as described by social scientist Rihanna Eisler, where elites, usually men, were allowed to use the right arm, the sword arm, to devise strategies and give orders to prepare for war if needed, representing the sympathetic system of the body that prepares for flight or fight. Their left arm, the one that stands for maintenance and care, akin to the parasympathetic system of the body, was bound behind their backs. Their subordinates, women and lowly men, suffered the inverse infliction. They were expected to exhaust themselves in service. None could use both arms. None could reach an inner balance. None could unfold their full potential. This is an injury that lasted for many millennia. It has many names. Patriarchy is one of them. I call it a war injury. Humanity suffered a millennia long systemic war injury. Our forebears accepted it, they lived with it and maintained it. Why? Because the preparedness for war had to be given priority in a world that was in the grip of the security dilemma. Very seldom you see this depiction such, such as this one where a woman holds a child with her left arm and a sword with her right arm. This image was given to me by Michael Harris Bond in 1999, cross-cultural psychologist at that time, professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Thank you, Michael. For the past millennia, increasingly, we humans have treated our biosphere as if it were just another enemy to be conquered. By now, our biosphere is like a teacher who enlightens us that competition for domination is a suboptimal strategy, even at its, even at its best. And in an interconnected and finite world, it is even collectively suicidal. Negligence of maintenance and replenishment is a hideous killer. And also here, the human body can illustrate it. Heart attack is the outcome, the typical emergency troubleshooter disease. When nurturing is seen as negligible and victory as desirable, when the nurturing of relationships among ourselves and with nature is neglected, worse even, when growth is promoted that is cancerous, collapse is the result. And this collapse is now with us. It took many millennia to manifest. We risk dying of our war injury now, of our misguided pride in domination that creates nothing but all out heart attack. Our pre pre perpetration of cogitocide catalyzes sociocide and ecocide and leads to omnicide. In this situation, we are extremely fortunate that our grandparents have enshrined human rights ideals because these ideals offer pathways to survival on earth in dignity, pathways to unite as a human family of equally responsible members who face our life-threatening global challenges together. As long as dignity is defined as equal dignity in mutual solidarity in the global village, rather than the autonomy of lone heroes competing for domination and control, the concept of dignity can bring together all religions, all faiths, all life-giving ideologies of this world. It can connect the sustainability community and the consciousness community into one overarching meta-narrative. Many faiths have my definition of religion at their core, namely love, humility, and or for a universe too large for us to fathom. A culture of peace and dignity can also bring together traditional male and female role descriptions. It can merge the courageous heroism that formerly was reserved for males 
with the care work that formerly was delegated to women. It can invite all people to embrace the conceptually female approaches that maintain social cohesion through applying strategies that are complex, relational, multilateral, foresighted, integrative, and holistic. We live in a new world now, a world where the glorification of war and domination must and can be transcended, and the heroism of honor can transmute into the heroism of dignity as highest form of personal meaning making, and this is also my part. We, the global community, have everything required to manifest what I call egalization. My coinage, it's short for equal dignity in solidarity and freedom and to dignify globalization so it becomes globalization. By adding global cooperation, we can arrive at co-globalization as the shortest summary of the path that can lead us into a dignified future. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has a long history. Our ancestors prior to the Neolithic Revolution lived in small groups that were rather egalitarian. The line in the middle represents the line of equal worthiness. I respect you just as I respect myself. All members of the group enjoy equal worthiness. I use the infinity symbol or Möbius strip, the horizontal eight, the lying eight, when I think of unity in diversity, of dialogue in partnership, of solidarity in equal dignity. And Mara is with us. She brought us this image. Thank you, Mara for finding this wonderful infinity dance on the website of the Alvin Ailey Dance Theatre in Manhattan. Then, when our species had completed what I call our first round of globalization, around the time of the Neolithic Revolution, when we walked all, Homo sapiens walked all continents, a dramatic shift occurred in a rather brief historical time span, abundant, expandable piles of resources turned into fixed ones. A win-win situation turned into a win-lose situation. Circumscription is a term used in anthropology, and the security dilemma and the commons dilemma became salient. Our forebears responded with a new ethos and emo emotional coinage. The era of honor began, which legitimized the vertical ranking of human worth into higher and lesser beings. Now, at present, we are participating in yet another radical shift as significant as 12,000 years ago. And the year 1948, with the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is its most prominent marker. We aspire to an ethos and emotional coinage of equal dignity in freedom and solidarity. At this point, we face important hurdles. We will we'll go all the way back again if we define equal dignity and freedom without solidarity. If we look at the maxim of the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, and solidarity, cooperation, and care, then all three goals are lost if only liberty is aimed at. Sociocide and ecocide are the result when empowerment becomes narcissism, when liberty is overdone, so to speak. The self-esteem movement in Western societies may precisely have suffered such an overshoot of empowerment. It may have created a social climate of solipsistic narcissism characterized by chronic indignation and anger entrepreneurship all against all. In my work, I therefore avoid using the term empowerment and replace it with entrustment. Entrustment suggests a larger obligation. It suggests that liberation movement, movements and uprisings need careful limits that all should meet in the middle, between up and down, between the top and the bottom of society, and together shoulder the responsibility for creating a better world in mutually dignifying and joint humility. Our prim primary task now is to finally unite as human families so we can leave behind 
all destructive dilemmas, promote global human security rather than military security, and realize what I call the blessings of the commons in the place of the tragedy of the commons. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights stipulates that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. On my global path, I'm often astonished when I observe the tremendous strength of this promise, despite being undermined and violently violated so frequently and ruthlessly. The reason for the strength of this promise appears to be that it speaks to a deep human desire, the desire to rise from being pushed down, to desire, the desire to stand upright. It is, it is an embodied longing beyond language, beyond legal instruments, the simple and straightforward yearning to be respected as fellow human being among fellow human beings. The strength of this yearning is also the reason for why breaking the promise of equal dignity humiliates so much more than when honor is infringed. It is the reason for why the violation of dignity carries the potential to lead to so much stronger re reactions than the violation of honor, why it can create the deepest of divisions. This is why I describe feelings of dignity humiliation as the nuclear bomb of the emotions. Not enough, the promise of equal dignity has also democratized the right to resist and given it to everyone. And more even, we also live in a world where technology is global now, so that a single angry hacker who feels entitled to seek retaliation for perceived humiliation can attack an, an entire country's electronic infrastructure from his basement. And cheap drones can make the most expensive war equipment obsolete. The uh, war now of uh, Azerbaijan against Armenia was won by cheap drones. Would-be Hitlers can establish global dictatorial mafia-like structures now with hitherto unseen ease. And so all these factors together have the power to fill the world with hot cycles of humiliation. Dynamics of humiliation, therefore, I fear will become the strongest obstacle to a dignified future for humanity. Clashes of civilizations are harmless compared with clashes of humiliation. Clashes of humiliation can undermine our best chances for cooperation. And this in a situation where we need cooperation more than ever. Cooperation at a global scale, global trust and mutual care that includes all of humanity. I very much value anthropologist William Urey's simplified depiction of history, where he pulls together elements from anthropology, game theory, and conflict studies. He describes three major types of society in chronological order, namely simple foragers, complex agriculturalists, and knowledge society. I use Urey's historical periods as a frame to insert the historical and social development of pride, honor, and dignity as follows. First, I call the first 79, 97%, first 97% of human history, the era of pristine, humble pride. Pristine because it is not yet touched by systemic humiliation. It was the time when foraging and small scale gardening was prevalent, when there were still no limits for migration and the few people walking the planet still had enough space to freely follow the wild food. If the planet were larger, we would still do it and follow the wild food. Second, the past 3% of human history, the period of complex agriculturalists, was the era of honor, or more precisely, the era of collectivistic ranked honor, of systemic humiliation and arrogant pride. Third, I de dedicate my life to working for a return to dignified pride for an era of dignity, or more precisely, I work for a future of equality and dignity for all as individuals who are free to engage in loving solidarity with each other and in mutually dignifying connection with all life on planet Earth. We are here now. How can we regain our blue and green planet? 
Anthropologist Margaret Mead is often quoted as saying, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Together with our dear Linda, you see her in the middle here, and a dedicated core group of scholars, educators, and practitioners, I have the honor of nurturing a global collaborative fellowship of people who wish to walk the talk of dignity. I do this work since the idea was for it was born in 2001 and Linda joined in 2003 and since then we do this work together. Our Dignity Fellowship has around 1,000 invited members and around 8,000 people on our address list and I'm so happy to know that some of you are here now. The outcome is in our hands. If we wait that others should save us, if we engage in apathy or selfish carelessness, the best outcome will be undignified survival for a few combined with undignified demise for the rest. If we give it our all, if we embrace appropriate levels of alarm, levels that match the size of the crisis we face, and if we invest this sense of alarm into hope against hope, then we will succeed with the dignified survival of all together, or if unavoidable, at least we will go down together in dignity. The Nobel Peace Prize is intended for people who work for ending war through global disarmament rather than through local arms races in the futile hope of reaching a lasting balance of power. You see here Bertha von Suttner, the woman who inspired Alfred Nobel to establish the Nobel Peace Prize. And in 1905, she was honored by that prize for her book, Die Waffen Nieder, Lay Down Your Arms. Linda and I, we see our work as following in the footsteps of Bertha von Suttner. Many members of our network were hugely encouraged through the nomination of our work for this prize in 2015, 2016, and 2017. And now on Thursday, the prize was awarded to the World Food Program. Congratulations. Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the most important authors of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. After the atrocities of the Second World War, the goal was never again. And this is also my life mission. When Rachel Carson published her book, Silent Spring, in 1962, many were full of hope for a su substantial turnaround. I was too. Earth Rise was the high spirit of the 1960s. Unfortunately, it transmuted into profit versus planet around 1970 to 1987. Then environmentalism turned into sustainability around 1987 to 1997, and finally into market environmentalism from 1998 to 2018. In 2019 came Greta Thunberg, and now in 2020, the COVID-19 virus, virus is with us. What comes next? Hopefully, a new Eleanor Roosevelt moment. This is pioneer Jean Baker Miller, mentor of our dear Linda Hartling. Both women follow in the footsteps of Bertha von Suttner and Eleanor Roosevelt, as do I. The fact that I hail from a family that is deeply traumatized by the two world wars of the last century means that I am particularly aware of the vulnerabilities of our human arrangements on this planet. All my life, I have been, been preparing for the next Eleanor Roosevelt moment like 1948, waiting for a new window of opportunity to open for dignity to regain the attention it deserves. Together with Linda, and other close collaborators, I am helping to nurture a moment like this to come, ready to be among its co-authors if needed, ready to contribute with our approach of loving dignity. 
the last, before I end, the last look at uh, us from a bird's eye or astronaut's perspective. Roughly 300,000 years ago, our forebears began to walk, Homo sapiens began to walk this planet and they enjoyed a party, a win-win situation of seemingly infinite abundance. 12,000 years ago, very roughly, this changed into a win-lose situation and our ancestors adapted with developing strategies of competition for domination with the security dilemma as outcome. Nine, 1757, 1948, we see egalization, equality in dignity in freedom and solidarity and the emergence of dignity humiliation. 1967, 72, we can for the first time see our planet from outside, a foundational shift in perspective. 1980, we start to overuse our planet's resources. Now we use more than one planet. 1991 marks the end of the Cold War, an opportunity to unite in one world. We missed it. 2007 and 8, we see the collapse of the blind belief in the wisdom of the market. Now, the generation life now carries more responsibility than any other generation before. The responsibility to co-create new ways of arranging our affairs on planet Earth without systemic humiliation. Co-create the next form of civilization where we cooperate with our own evolution. We manifest what Gandhi called Satyaha Graha. The sustainability development goals set by the uh, United Nations General Assembly for 2030 are a worthy start. However, only if goal eight is seriously reconfigured. Goal eight shows an exponential economic growth curve, a curve that is impossible in a finite context. Goal eight has the potential to undermine all other goals. Philip Alston, outgoing UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights warns, the UN Sustainability Development Goals are clearly not going to be met without drastic recalibration, as this framework places immense and mistaken faith in growth and the private sector. This is also my conclusion from my global experience. For me, dignity is a mandate, the duty to transform the world. I have coined the term dignism, dignityism. The aim is to point at the positive goals of co globe egalization and to leave behind the hot button words, capitalism, socialism, communism, hot button words. This is how I describe dignism. Somebody is having their microphone on. Could you please mute your microphone? It is very disturbing. I cannot continue as long as this microphone is on. Thank you. Dignism describes a world where every newborn finds a space and is nurtured to unfold their highest and best, embedded in a social context of loving appreciation and connection. It is a world where the caring capacity of the planet guides the ways in which everyone's basic needs are met. It is a world where we unite in respecting human dignity and celebrating diversity, where we prevent unity from devolving into oppressive uniformity and keep diversity from sliding into hostile division. Let me end here. If we, as humanity, wish to heal ecocide and sociocide and survive in dignity, we need a strong cogitosphere, a strong realm of thinking. Therefore, the first step could the, please, uh, somebody who has the microphone on, uh, mute it? That would be of great help. Thank you. Therefore, the first step is to overcome cogitocide, the destruction of our thinking. We, are, we as humanity need to face the fact that we stand at the edge of a Seneca cliff, the kind of rapid couple collapse that is characteristic of complex systems when they disintegrate. It's called Seneca cliff, steep. We have to face this fact without panic that we stand at this edge and without denial. Our scientists inform us that we have a window of opportunity of around 10 years to step back from the edge. In this situation, in the interconnected world of today, Seeking peace through armament amounts 
to sociocide at a global scale, the killing of the cohesion in the global community. It hastens global ecocide through global sociocide by maintaining the security dilemma. Rem you remember, if you want peace, prepare for war. And by stoking cycles of humiliation and by putting fuel into the growth dilemma, you remember, if you want prosperity, invest in exploitation. In an interconnected world in which the promise of human rights ideals is salient, feelings of humiliation are the nuclear bomb of the emotions. Cycles of humiliation will turn the global village into a war zone if we do not step up to prevent it. Citizens to citizens trust building at a global scale is the only path I see to transcending the security dilemma and achieving lasting global peace and dignity. And this is our global work. This is what we do in our global dignity community. The call must be, let us celebrate respect for equal dignity for all as responsible individuals free to engage in loving mutual solidarity let us celebrate diversity through unity in equality and dignity without humiliation on this small and finite planet that is our common home. As the world watches the heartbreaking coronavirus pandemic unfold, our hope is for an exponential change of heart so that global unity rooted in respect for local diversity becomes possible. The central question we face as humanity which we must ask and answer together in all languages, not just the four languages noted here, remains. How must we, as humanity, arrange our affairs on this planet so that dignified life will be possible in the long term? Wie können wir die Menschheit, unsere Angelegenheiten auf diesem Planeten so gestalten, dass ein würdiges Leben langfristig möglich ist? Wo dann mo wie menes geheten, ordne wo resake po dene planeten zlik at verdi liv, blie müli po lang sikt? Comment devons nous, l'humanité, organiser nos affaires sur cette planète pour qu'une vie digne soit possible à long terme? Thank you very, very much.